and I'm so pleased to welcome you to today's session of our summer lecture series, learning series, um, A Wandering People, Jewish Journeys, Real and Imagined. A special welcome to any first time attendees. We're very pleased to have uh, Dr. Rachel Rosenthal, Assistant Professor of Talmud and Rabbinics, teaching us today. Her topic is Work-Life Balance in Ancient Times, Why the Rabbis Left Their Homes to Study Torah. Um, so we're really looking forward to learning with you, Dr. Rosenthal. Um, we want to make sure everyone knows about our sponsorship opportunities. If you are um, inspired by this wonderful learning with JTS Scholars, we invite you to partner with us by sponsoring a learning session. We have two uh, sponsorship levels, Chacham for $540 and Sadiq for $1,000, and you can learn more by emailing learninglives at jtsa.edu. Um, Dr. Rosenthal will pause um, a few times during the session today for questions, and um, as returnees know, if you wish to ask a question, um, you can submit it to me via the chat, and I will um, select as many as I can to pose to Dr. Rosenthal. Um, if you have any technical or logistical questions, you can direct those to JTS staff, Stacy Firestone or Lynn Feynman. And you should have received the sources uh, for today's class in the email that you got with the Zoom link. Um, and I believe that we'll be screen sharing them as well. So on that note, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rachel, Rosen Dr. Rachel Rosenthal. Um, Adjunct Assistant Professor of Talmud at JTS and a research fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America. And um, in addition to her work at JTS and Hartman, she teaches at Central Synagogue, Lincoln Square Synagogue, a um, variety of other settings around the world. And she's really, um, she's really known for her combination of um, excellent scholarship and in just um, stimulating accessible teaching. So we're so pleased that you join us today, Dr. Rosenthal, and I turn it over to you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Andelman, for that kind introduction. Thank you all for, for being here. Um, I'm impressed by people who, during vacation season, are still showing up to learn Torah. So um, what we're going to do today is we're going to learn a series of, um, of agadot, which are short stories, short rabbinic stories, um, that all appear um, as a unit in Tractate Ketubo. So for people who are not familiar, Ketubot is a tractate um, that really deals primarily with married life, um, also the process a little bit of entering marriage, um, but primarily married life. And the, the question that we're going to be looking at today um, through the lens of these stories is what sort of obligations do rabbis in particular have to their families? Um, and related to that, I'm curious to think about the implications of why it would be that the rabbis would tell unflattering stories about themselves um, or complicated stories about themselves might be another way of saying it. Because part of what we're gonna see in these stories is that there's a clear assumption that there's some sort of obligation to be learning Torah. There's also an assumption that there's some sort of obligation that people have towards their families. And for whatever reason, and this is part of what we're gonna try to suss out over the next hour and a half or so, for whatever reason, there's also an assumption that those two things cannot exist at the same time, but instead what it means to strike balance between family life on one hand and Torah on the other hand is to find a way to divide one's time, not necessarily equally, but perhaps equitably, um, to divide one's time between um, Torah learning and family life. And the question of how exactly that's going to happen is going to be at the heart of, um, of these sources. And I, I'll say that this is something that I um, relate to in a way that I didn't necessarily before because I had a, a baby almost seven months ago um, and she is home right now uh, with a babysitter because we still don't have full-time childcare uh, because of COVID life. And so um, this question of what does it mean for me to be sitting here and learning Torah with all of you while my family is happening um, just you know a few feet away, um, I think is at the heart of a lot of this. And I imagine this is something that a number of you have felt in one way or another over the course of the last however many months. So, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to learn these stories together. I think it's worth looking at them as a unit as well as individually. So that's what we're going to do. And um, in the course of us doing that, um, as Rabbi Andelman said, people are welcome to put questions or comments in the chat and I'll pause periodically so we can engage with that. The last thing I want to say by way of introduction and then we'll go into the sources themselves is that there's one more story in this unit of text. Um, that we're not looking at today, which is the story of Rabbi Akiva and his wife. 
Um, and the main reason that we're not looking at that Rabbi Akiva story is because I think in many ways, that is the best known one. Um, if you're not familiar with it, don't worry. But I think seeing these other stories, which don't get lionized for reasons that will become clear, um, makes a much more complicated vision of what it means to, to marry someone who's devoted to Torah than what we might see in that Rabbi Akiva story. So if there's time, which there probably won't be, but if there's time, I'll talk a little bit about it at the end. But I do want to note that it's significant that that story comes at the end of this unit, um, as opposed to existing in a vacuum by itself, or at least in this context. So, okay. Um, so Stacey, if when you are get a moment, you could share the screen for us, that would be wonderful. Um, okay, thank you. So, um, so I titled this class, um, Work-Life Balance in Ancient Times, Why the Rabbis Left Their Homes to Study Torah. So the, the Mishnah that this piece of Talmud is commenting on, that this piece of Gemara is commenting on, talks about how often a husband is obligated to come home, uh, presumably to have sex with his wife. That seems to be the, the underlying assumption as to why, um, why the rabbis um, need to come back. In addition to financial obligations that husbands have to their wives, in the book of Exodus, what we see is it says, Sheirak Sutava Onata Lo Yigra, which means that a husband is not allowed to withhold clothing, food, and sex from his wife. Clothing and food can be provided via a third party or via some sort of bank account. But of course, sex can only be provided by the husband himself. And so, what the Mishnah explains is that depending on your job, you'll be expected to be available to have sex with your wife at different intervals. So for example, if you are sort of a man of leisure who just lies around, then you'll have to have, be available to have sex with your wife every day, which does not mean by any means she has to have sex with you every day. It just means you have to be available for that. Whereas if you are a sailor, you have to come home once every six months, right? Because saying that a sailor has to be available to have sex with his wife every day, that's just not a realistic standard for us to be putting forward in light of the fact that um, people who went out on, on these ships, they would be gone for very, very long periods of time. So the one thing the Mishnah adds there is this interesting addition, which says that a Torah scholar can go out for 30 days without his wife's permission. So it seems then that the standard is ideally the Torah scholar is available once a week to have sex with his wife. He should come home for Shabbat, um, but he can go for up to 30 days without his wife's permission. Um, and if she gives permission, he can go for even longer than that. So those are sort of the operating assumptions having to do with, with what we're talking about here. So the series of stories starts out with the story of Rav Rechumi. Rav Rechumi is a not particularly prominent Babylonian rabbi. Um, so he studied in the school of Rava at Machoza. Machoza was one of the um, main centers of, of rabbinic Jewish life. And he used to come home um, every Erev Yom Kippur. So the strange thing about coming home on Erev Yom Kippur is that one of the restrictions of Yom Kippur is that you're not allowed to have sex, right? You're not allowed to eat, you're not allowed to drink, you're not allowed to adorn yourself, wear leather shoes, and you're not allowed to have sex. So this is a very strange time for him to be coming home. Of course, we don't know how long he's staying, but to me, there's already an implication in this that he is somehow distant from his, from his family, based on the fact that this is when he chooses to come home. But what happened? One day, um, presumably one year, he was highly absorbed in his learning. His wife was expecting him, saying, he is coming soon, he is coming soon, right? Because she knows it's Aragum Kippur. And it's, it's interesting to think about how this works. It seems that the rest of the year, she doesn't expect him to come back. But in exchange for that, on Erev Yom Kippur, we expect him to come home. So, but when he did not arrive, she became depressed. She, um, she became very sad and um, tears began to flow from her eyes. The, the, the Aramaic is kalash data, um, which literally means her, wine, her mind became weak. So she, she became very sad and tears began to flow from her eyes. He was at that moment sitting on the roof. We'll talk about why he was sitting on the roof in a minute. He was sitting on the roof and the roof collapsed under him and he died. So this is not a very pleasant story. Certainly we can see a few things to note. So why was he sitting on the roof? It actually was fairly common for people to sit on, on roofs back then because that was often where you would have 
um, the most air circulation and the like. So that's that's what he was doing up there. But of course, it's useful um, in this particular story to think about, um, right? It's a useful device um, to to um, to be able to kill him that way. You can imagine also if he's inside, the roof collapses on him. It could have a similar sort of feeling. So one of the things that we have to ask when we look at a story like this is, do we think that this story is true? By which I mean, do we think that either this was actually a historical fact or alternatively that the rabbis saw it as, an, uh, as, a, um, as, a historical, as a historical fact? And I actually think that that's the wrong question to ask here because I think more, in question than whether, more important than whether this actually happened is thinking about what it means that the rabbis choose to tell this story. Right, so why would it be that they're going forward and they're saying, um, this is what happens to someone who doesn't come home and his wife expects him to. And one of the things that we have to notice when we look at this story is that um, it doesn't seem to me, and if people disagree, then by all means weigh in, but it doesn't seem to me that there's any rebuke involved in the fact that the um, in the fact that he only comes home once a year, right? To me, the rebuke in the story is that he doesn't come home when he's expected to. So if what he negotiated with his wife is that he will come home only once a year, then that is fine. But it means that when that once a year comes, he needs to come as well. And there's something very striking about this image of he's absorbed in his learning, right? Because to me, that must mean that he's so absorbed, right? Arab Yom Kippur is a particularly important occasion um, because first of all, you have to prepare for the holiday, but additionally, there's a festive meal called Sudat Masaket, the, the final meal before Yom Kippur um, that you have to prepare, right? Because you can't eat on Yom Kippur itself. And so it's important that you eat this festive meal beforehand. Um, and in fact, the, the rabbis say in the Talmud and in, in Yoma, that just as it's an obligation to fast on Yom Kippur, it's an obligation to eat on Arab Yom Kippur. And the reason why I mention this is because it seems to me then that there's probably a lot going on around him, either with other people leaving to go home or alternatively preparing for the fast in a number of ways. And he seems to be so cut off from the rest of the world that he's totally unaware of the fact that this is happening around him. And I wonder if part of the rebuke, and the reason why I see a rebuke is because the roof collapses under him and ties. I wonder if part of the rebuke in this is the goal of learning Torah is not just to learn Torah by itself, the goal of learning Torah is that it should um, inform our actions, right? There's the dispute that, that appears in, in Kushin about which is greater, study or action. And the conclusion that they ultimately come to is that study is greater because study leads the, to action, right? We don't learn Torah just for the sake of learning Torah. We learn Torah in order that we should know how to go out and be in the world. And it seems to me that Rev. Rahumi has really failed on that particular front because he is so cut off from what is happening around him. He's so absorbed only in Torah that he forgets that he actually has other obligations to fulfill. And it is true that learning Torah is a mitzvah, but so is attending to your family, having children. Those are also mitzvot. And so, um, you know, the, the clear rebuke that exists in the story, I think is worth us noting because this image of the roof collapsing from under him, right? And he dies, it's of course very tragic, but I think that there's something significant about the fact that this is how this is how the authors of the story choose to put this forward. And just to say one other thing about this, the part of the story that feels complicated to me is um, as much as Rev Rahumi is punished in that he is no longer alive, right? He's clearly punished in this um, in this moment. As much as he is punished, at the same time, it seems clear to me that his wife is also punished. Because as much as his wife only expects him once a year, she's mourning his absence. And it seems that in his morning, in that morning, right? Um, through her crying in that morning, she, it basically like her vision is recognized in a way that his absence of appearing when he's supposed to means that he's actually gonna be absent from the world altogether. Um, and um, in fact, Right. If we go to if we go to box two, I think box two subtly but supports this idea because the box two they ask a question of how often are scholars supposed to have sex with their wives, and Rav Yehuda says in the name of Shmuel every Friday night, Arab Shabbat, Arab Shabbat. So every every Friday night, 
Um, and then they quote from the book of Psalms, chapter one, the book of Psalms that brings fruit, uh, brings forth fruit in its season. Rav Yehuda and say, some say it's Rav Hunar, some say it's Rav Nachman. So there's a dispute over who said this, maybe a number of people said this, right? But whoever it was, this is the one who performs his marital duty every Shabbat. And um, if any of you have ever heard the idea um, that having sex on Shabbat is a double mitzvah, um, in fact, it's Rashi's commentary on this very part, because what does Rashi say? Rashi says there are two mitzvot being upheld. So one is the mitzvah of pruravu, of having children. And the other mitzvah is oneg Shabbat, that you're supposed to be joyful on Shabbat. And because sex gives pleasure, um, that's the other mitzvah you are fulfilling. By having sex, you are able to fulfill the mitzvah of oneg Shabbat. And so it's striking to me that this piece, what we have in box two, follows what we have in box one. Because part of what we see in, in box number one is this man who seems to be totally cut off from the physical, right? He's so absorbed in his, in his learning. He doesn't notice what I assume is happening around him. He forgets to think of his family. Um, and he's just totally absorbed in the, um, in the psychological and um, in the intellectual. And I think we can imagine a scenario wherein someone would say, oh, look at him. He's so pious, right? How wonderful that he's so devoted to his learning that he doesn't even see what is happening around him. But actually this comes back and really challenges that idea because what the Gemara is saying here is actually that pleasure that comes from the act of having sex with your wife. But I would say general physical pleasure, right? And the pleasure of being around people and the pleasure of being as part of a family that that's actually a mitzvah in and of itself. That's actually a mitzvah as well. And so therefore what we shouldn't do is assume that there's a nobility in what Rav Rahumi is doing, but instead we should see this as a critique of Rav Rahumi and understand that actually um, having sex with your wife is not a bad thing, but instead it is a, a um, it's actually the fulfillment of a, of a mitzvah that in and of itself is a religious act. So where we might some, maybe think of sex as a, um, as being opposed from religion, right? Including the fact that on Yom Kippur, for example, we know you're not supposed to have sex. I wonder if Rav Rahumi has been um, refraining from having sex with his wife. And that's why he comes home on Erev Yom Kippur. It's interesting to think about what that might mean. And the Gemara, it seems to me, is, is offering a little bit of a review. So I'm going to pause here for a minute. Um, do we have any comments or questions that have come in so far? If not, we'll continue on. But um, we, I just had one about one second ago. Um, I'm having a little trouble understanding the question. Um, why don't Why don't you keep going, and I will okay. um, I'll go through it again, and we'll and uh, share it in Great. the next pause. Okay, so let's go on then, Stacy, uh, if you don't mind, to box number three. Thank you. Okay, so this is where things get a little bit strange. Um, so so we have story number one, which is Rava Fumi. So now, even though this is box number three, this is story number two, right? So we have this interlude um, about having sex with your wife in the middle. So the Gemara goes on to tell us about Yehuda, the son of Rabbi Chia, who is the son-in-law of, of Rabbi Yanai. So a couple of things to note about Yehuda, right? So he both is the son of a great rabbi, Rabbi Chia, the son-in-law of another great rabbi, Rabbi Yanai. Excuse me, also notice that he himself does not have a rabbinic title yet. So whether that's significant or not, I don't know. But we'll notice that he um, does not have the honorific that is given to both his father and his father-in-law. So he was always um, going and sitting in the house of Rav, right? So he would go away and he would learn Torah. But every hour of Shabbat, he came home. So this seems like a more normal sort of schedule um, that he would go away for the week, right? He sort of was dorming at the yeshiva. Um, but he would come home every hour of Shabbat um, to be with his family for Shabbat. And in light of what we saw in box number two, right, this makes sense that he would choose to do this. This is a particular moment where it's excellent to be with your family, where it's in particular ex excellent to, to experience intimacy with your wife, to have sex with your wife. Um, and an interesting fact that Gemara tells us about, Rabbi, about Yehuda, sorry, rather, is whenever he arrived, people saw a pillar of light moving before him. Uh, this Amuda de Nora, right? This pillar of, of light or of fire. And part of what is worth noting here, which I think is intentional, is the other time that we see a pillar of fire is when the Israelites are in the, in the desert 
um, during the day, God appears to them as a pillar of cloud, but during the night, God appears to them as a pillar of fire. So there seems then to be something particularly holy about Yehuda um, that he um, that he has this, this physical manifestation of, I would say, divine power that, that moves along with him. And the other piece of this, of course, is that everybody knows when he's coming, right? There's no way to sneak quietly into town if when you walk around, there's this giant pillar of, of light or fire that goes before you. But similar to what we saw in story number one, one day he was absorbed in his learning, um, right? And presumably therefore he didn't, um, he didn't get up to go home before Shabbat because he didn't notice. And not seeing this, this sign, Rabbi Yanai, remember Rabbi Yanai is his father-in-law, interesting dimension in this story. Rabbi Yanai said to those, like the people around him, he said to them, lower his bed or overturn his bed and overturning someone's bed is a sign of mourning. This is part of what is outlined elsewhere in the Gemara and Moad Katan, that part of the way that you express learning is you overturn our bed. Um, so overturn the bed. For had Yehuda been alive, he would not have neglected the performance of his marital duties. So this is a little bit awkward because Rabbi Yana is basically saying, um, right, it must be that Yehuda is dead because if Yehuda were alive, he would never neglect the opportunity to come home and have sex with his wife, um, i.e. my daughter. That's where I feel like it gets a little bit strange. And um, the, the Gemara here now quotes from chapter 10 of Kohelet of Ecclesiastes, like an error that came forth from the ruler, and Yehuda died. Okay, so just so we're clear on what happens in the story, right? Yehuda usually comes home every, um, every hour of Shabbat, one week. Oh, and when he comes home, there's this pillar of fire in front of him, which is likely to indicate his extreme righteousness. But one week he didn't come home and his father-in-law, um, his wife's father, seeing that he didn't come home, says the only reason Yehuda wouldn't come home, it would be if he was dead. And as soon as Rabbi Yanai said, it must be that he's dead because otherwise he would have come home. As soon as he said that, um, Yehuda then died by virtue of what Rabbi, what Rabbi Yanai had said about him. So it's not in this case, what's different here than the previous story is well, there are a few things that are different, but I think are worth noting. The first thing that's different that is worth noting is that Yehuda um, is actually somewhat absent from the story in an interesting way, right? He's talked about, but we don't actually see much about him. The second thing that's interesting is um, his wife is completely absent from the story. We don't, all we know is he's married, but we know nothing about uh, Rabiana's wife. Uh, sorry, Rabiana's daughter. We don't know anything about her. We don't know if she cares if her husband comes home. We don't know if she assumes that he's dead or she just figures he's running late or whatever else, right? Instead, it's his father-in-law who seems to be very intensely involved in the, um, in the events that are occurring in this particular moment. Um, what we see is it seems that it's not God that kills him in this case, right? I think there's an argument to be made that in the Rev Rahumi story, God essentially kills Rev Rahumi, right? It's it's a um, recognition of, of the wife's tears that cause, causes Rabbi Homi to die. Here it's Rabbi Yanai saying, oh, well, I assume he must be dead because otherwise this wouldn't happen. Um, so that I think is worth, is worth us noting. Um, and I, I wonder, and this is the part I'm not sure about, so if anyone has any thoughts about it, I would love to, to hear them because I wonder what it might mean that um, even though the outcome is the same, that the series of events that leads to the outcomes, it feels very different to me in this story of Yehuda than it did in the Rev Rahumi story. It felt to me, it feels to me here almost like, I would say almost like a comedy of errors because it's obviously not funny if you are, um, you know, dead at the end of the story, um, right? But just, it's just a giant misunderstanding. Whereas the first story, the story of Rev Rahumi felt particularly tragic to me, right? That the wife is sitting there and crying. And I think part of what I'm experiencing when I read this story is there something about the wife's absence that makes this whole thing just feel like, oh, a giant misunderstanding, right? And I would be very curious to hear about what the wife's perspective is. Now, I have to assume that Yehuda's wife, um, Rabbi Yanai's daughter, I have to assume that she is still living at home with her family, right? That's what it seems like is happening here, because that's how Rabbi Yanai knows he's not coming home, I guess, unless they live in the same town. 
And the reason why this is worth noting is because usually what will happen in, in rabbinic times is that when a woman gets married, she goes and she lives with her husband's family. So this is already unusual that they seem to be camping out with her family rather than her husband's family. Um, and yeah, and then the last piece that, I, that I'm still sort of trying to work through is what it, why the Gemara gives us this detail about the pillar of fire, because if he is so, so, so righteous, even so, Rabbi is able to kill him just by, just by making this observation of he clearly would have come home. But I think it's worth noting that part of his righteousness, therefore, I would assume, is the fact that he's not neglecting his family, right? And you can imagine a paradigm wherein the rabbis would say, what does it mean for someone to be righteous? Part of what it means for someone to be righteous is they basically live a monk life existence, right? And they, yes, they know they have this obligation to, um, to fulfill, to be fruitful and multiply, but sort of they're not interested in these bodily carnal pleasures. And, you know, the closer you are to living as a, as a monk, the better. But what we see here is that actually um, that Rav is, uh, sorry, that, uh, that Yehuda, um, it's partly his attention to his family, right? It's partly his willingness or his eagerness even to come home every hour of Shabbat or maybe just his feeling of obligation, right? We can read it in all sorts of ways to come home on Arab Shabbat, but whatever it is, he, um, the, the pillar of fire is lost and it's the loss of that pillar of fire, right? Rabbi Yanai is looking for the, the sign. And it's interesting because the language of the Aramaic, it's uh, came on the lo chaze hahu simana when he didn't see the sign, which means Rabbi Yanai was not actually looking for Yehuda himself. Rabbi Yanai is looking for the sign of Yehuda. And I think that piece also complicates the narrative a little bit. Um, okay, do we have any questions or comments or should I continue on? Yeah, now we have plenty of questions and comments. Okay. Um, okay, so um, maybe actually just a, a kind of direct textual one. Um, someone asked if you could just elaborate on how the, how the quote from Kohelet is, is working here. Yes, absolutely. So the idea is when they say that it's like a mistake that comes first from the ruler, the idea is that if the king makes an incorrect judgment or an incorrect ruling, it still comes to be. So that um, by virtue of being the king, you have the power to make this sort of decree, even if it, even if the decree is ultimately incorrect. And the people who hear you, their obligation is to fulfill your decree rather than saying, oh, this is an error. So, so to hear, it's not necessarily that yeah, um, Yehuda deserved to die, but rather that Yanai is so, Rabbi Yanai is so powerful, um, right? he's equivalent to the ruler, that as soon as he says he must be dead, um, it has to be that right, this, mistaken, this mistaken ruling has to come to be. Um, and thus Yehuda, Yehuda dies because Rabbi, yeah, because Rabbi Yanai says he must be dead. Um, and by the way, this verse is used elsewhere in the Gemara also in a similar sort of context where someone makes an assumption that ends up having very significant consequences. Um, and in the course of doing so makes that makes the assumption come to be true, even though it wasn't actually true before they said anything. Um, great, thank you. So one more on this story and then I'll go back to um, Rebbe Fumi. So um, someone was suggesting that the, um, that the pillar of fire um, appears earlier in Ketubot in the, in the Ketad Meraktim Lifnea Kala, um, area and maybe that would shed light on the meaning here? Um, I would have to go back and look at that sugya so yeah, in Ketubo 1 before okay. I could um, comment on it, yes. But yeah, it's interesting. It, it also appears um, in some of the death of the rabbi stories where very, very um, sort of the most important of the rabbis when they die, if they die sort of away from people, one of the things that happens is their body gets surrounded by this pillar of fire and which inhibits the other rabbis from being able to go in and get their body and then be able to bury them. And often what the rabbis have to do in those cases is entreat God and say, God, we're trying to show respect to this person. But, you know, they say only one or two people in a generation merit to have this sort of pillar of fire appear before them. So it's definitely meant to be this, this sign of righteousness and also a sign that even as they're among rabbis, they're actually even better than the other rabbis. So definitely this is a motif we see not just in the Torah, um, when, when the Jews are traveling through the wilderness, but also also elsewhere in the Gemara as a sign of um, extreme righteousness on, on the part of the rabbi. And it's worth noting that that righteousness is not always about they knew the most Torah. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's about other things instead. 
Got it. Okay. Um, okay. So going back to Ever So um, this the person um, the person was pointing out that it's it seems like the reason the roof collapses and and he meets this fate is because of his wife's feelings, like that she got mm -hmm. depressed and cried. And um, and the questioner was wondering, uh, you know, if she didn't mind, <laughs> um, if she you know, or if she had kind of given up on him, um, does nothing, does nothing happen? Do we not pass, does no one pass the same kind of judgment on him? It's like, is it, is it still wrong? It's a sort of, if the, you know, if a tree falls in the forest kind of question. Yeah, it's a great question um, because it seems to me that the answer is, this is actually all because she cries. And that if she just said, oh, well, I guess he's not coming home then nothing bad would have happened to him. Um, so part of this feels to me a little bit like, you know, if you've ever met someone who's like particularly superstitious and they'll say something like, Lea and Hara, poo, 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 right? Like, don't bring on that, that evil eye, et cetera. Um, the, the concern or, you know, I guess jinx would be the, the secular equivalent of this, right? The fear that by mentioning something, you're going to bring it to be in the world. Um, so yes, it does seem that her awareness of his not coming um, is what brings it on. And it's interesting because she, she doesn't say, oh, I guess he's dead, right? Part of what's different in story one and story two is that in the Yehuda story, Yanai specifically says he must be dead. And in the first story, she doesn't actually say anything, but the implication seems to just be, oh, he's not coming, right? And I actually think that that distinction is important because to me, I always read it as her tears are not about, I'm worried my husband is dead, but it's he only comes home once a year on Arab before, and now he's not even doing that, right? That the sadness that's coming forward for him, for, for her is, the feeling of my husband cares about me so little that he can't even come home once a year, um, which is different than, oh, it must be that he's dead because of course he would come home, right? It seems to me she has actually very little faith in her husband to the point where I, I sort of wonder sometimes when I read this, if she's, she's very sad, but almost not surprised that this is what has happened, right? Whereas in the Yehuda story, um, it's this, that's what I, other than the part where it ends in death, it feels almost like a comedy of errors, right? Everyone's just misunderstanding what's happening. And that's what leads to the, that's what leads to the loss. Um, Can you take one, one more quick one? Yes, absolutely. Um, or, or not quick. Um, the question is about, um, do we, do we need to think of these, um, you know, the, the, husband's obligations to their wives um, in the context of the, the, the purpose of sex, which is procreation. Like, is it, is it really uh, wedded, no pun intended, intended to, that, to that context? Or um, if a woman is past childbearing age, do these obligations fall away and we no longer care? It's a great question. So no, part of what's interesting is that the obligation to have sex is actually distinct from the obligation to have children. And um, in the, and, and that distinction is actually, is actually made, including from the fact that one of the most interesting things about the mitzvah to have children is that women are actually exempt from that mitzvah. It's like a little bit surprising, right? Because it's difficult for men to have children without women um, in, in some sort of form. Um, and the, the, you know, there are a number of reasons explained for this. And this is a, it's a Sagin Yevamot where they talk about it and that the way it gets explained in the halachic literature is, we don't command people to do things that put their lives in danger. And because pregnancy and childbirth still is, but certainly back then all the more so were very dangerous for women, technically women are not obligated, only men are obligated in it. That being said, women still have the right to um, demand, I guess uh, might be the right word, sex from their, from their husbands, for reasons having nothing to do with children. And part of the way that we know this is there's a, there's a dispute between Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel whether the obligation to have children is to have two sons or whether it's to have one son and one daughter. Um, but theoretically, once a man has two, let's say two sons and one daughter, right? So therefore has fulfilled the obligation according to everyone, um, he still has an obligation to have sex with his wife. And there are actually stories about women who take st drink sterilizing potions to choose not to have more children and things like that. So um, yeah, the sex is is separate from the um, from the child, from the child's birth or the pregnancy piece. And it seems that part of what it's just about is that the husband has to provide for his wife sort of the basic comforts and pleasures of life. And an assumption is that one of those basic comforts and pleasures is going to be some sort of sexual relationship. You know, Judaism is in this way somewhat, un somewhat I don't, 
yeah, I would say like somewhat unusual among at least some other religions in that it's, it imagines sex only between a man and a woman in the context of marriage. But in that context, it's actually fairly sex positive that the pleasure that one gets from sex actually has nothing to do with, um, nothing to do with the obligation to have children, which is why a man still has to have sex with his wife, or at least be available to have sex with his wife. He can't force her actually, but has to be available to have sex with his wife even if she is unable to have more children, even if she is currently pregnant and therefore will not become pregnant again, even if she has gone through menopause and therefore cannot bear children anymore, right? Even in all of those cases, the obligation for the sexual relationship remains. So we can really, um, I think what you're making clear is we can really read these stories as being about, uh, about the marital relationship. It's sort of yeah. a pure version of the, the tension between the marital relationship and Torah study with, without, um, it's, it's really not about other halakhic obligations. Correct. And I think one, one useful way to think of it might be physical pleasure versus intellectual pleasure. And that both of those pieces are very, very important. And that part of the reason why we see that all of these rabbis are going away, right? Because you can imagine if Rebbe Kumi is coming home only once a year, why doesn't he just pick up his family and move it to, right, where I see he's in Makosa, right? Um, why doesn't he just, yeah, why doesn't he just pick up his family and move them to Makosa, right? Like, it's not easy to move, but it's doable. It's interesting that he feels like those, those things have to be kept separate. And that's really the theme in all of these stories, right? Rabbi Yanai, um, right, he, he assumes that Yehuda is going to come home, but he only assumes that Yehuda is going to come home because he assumes that Yehuda is going to go away. And so it's interesting, part of the, the theme that exists in all of these stories is that for whatever reason, these, these men feel like their Torah life and their home life need to be not only separate intellectually, they have to be physically separate from one another, that they, they take place even in different cities. And so when we think about what the implications of that might be, um, I think it says something interesting about sort of what does it mean for us to, you know, strive for work-life balance that, you know, there are some people who say like, when you're at work, you should think about work. And when you're at home, you should think about home things. You shouldn't think about home at work. You shouldn't think about work at home. And that seems to me totally unrealistic. But that's sort of the, the vision that's put forward under the assumption that you need to have some sort of boundary, um, some sort of boundary that exists. And that's what we see here also. But the problem is that it's very easy then for things to get out of whack in the, in the process of doing that. And that's part of the issue that comes to the fore here. Okay, but let's keep going because I want to make sure we see at least more of these stories, if not all of them. Um, okay, so we're gonna look at four and five together. Um, so if we can just scroll a little bit, yes, thank you. Okay, so the first, oh wait, scroll up a little more because the beginning of four, there we go. Okay, so we'll start with this and then we'll scroll down. So now we have two stories involving Rebbe's son. So Rebbe is Rebbe Huda Hanasi, um, and he is, uh, or Judah the Prince is his English name. And Rebbe Huda Hanasi is, um, the um, the leader of the Jewish community in the land of Israel. He also is the um, compiler and editor of the Mishnah, which is why he merits to just be called rabbi um, as opposed to being called by his full name because he's so important. And so it's important for us to note that he has both a lot of Torah power, meaning he's the head of the baby drash and the head of the court, but also that he has um, significant status and financial power as well by virtue of being the Nasi, being the prince of this community. Um, and the way that he gets that status is through um, his family being able to trace their roots back to King David, which is gonna be important in this, in this story. Okay, so Revi was busy with the arrangements of the marriage for his son um, into the family of Rabbi Fia. So Rabbi Fia is another very important, prominent rabbinic uh, figure in, in the Talmud. And so it's not surprising that Rebbe would, would be wanting his son to marry into the family of Rebbe Chia, because um, as is still the case today among certain um, royal families, also certain rabbinic dynasties in the Haredi world, you'll see this as well, um, where powerful families choose to marry within each other. So that seems to be what's happening here. But then something terrible happens. Um, when the ketubah was, um, was about to be written, the bride died. So this is very sad. So Rebbe Chia's daughter has now died. Um, and Rebbe's response here, I would say, is, I would argue, fairly disturbing. So is there, God forbid, any taints, right? So what, right, achas v'shalom p'sula ika? So it seems that Rebbe's assumption is that the reason why this bride has died is because this was not an appropriate wedding to have happened. And therefore, basically, God kills her in order to stop this good wedding, this bad wedding from going forward. So there are a number of very troubling aspects 
um, involved in that, which I assume people can can come up with on their self by themselves. But a few of them, which is number one, wasn't there another way to communicate that this marriage shouldn't happen other than killing this poor girl? Um, number two, um, how can Rebbe show sort of a full on lack of compassion to both his son and to Rebbe Chia, both of whom I assume have um, experienced some sort of trauma? I don't assume necessarily that Rebbe's son has has met this girl. Um, or like necessarily is in love with her or anything, but you know, it's, it's traumatic when you're about to write the ketubah, which suggests that you're about to get betrothed formally, um, that to all of a sudden have have your fiance drop dead. So that seems upsetting. Um, and yeah, this is a moment where um, when I've learned this story with my rabbinical students, we talk about this as like a failure of pastoral care, right? That there's a total um, lack of empathy that Rebbe shows, but instead he's concerned about improper improper marriages. So. So what happened? So they went and um, did a um, investigation into the into the families, basically to, to trace their lineage. Um, and what they found was that Rebbe was descended from um, from Shefatia, who was the son of Avital. Avital is one of David's many wives, whereas Rebbe Chia was um, descended from Shimi, the brother of, of David. So why is this a problem? Because you'll remember if you have learned the book of Samuel, Sefer Shmuel, that what we see in Sefer Shmuel is that Rebbe, is, sorry, that um, David takes the kingship from Shaul, right? David takes, takes the kingship from King Saul. He is not descended from him. King Saul, in fact, is from the tribe of Benjamin, a totally different tribe. And that therefore, while all of David's children are therefore granted royal status, including Rebbe in this particular case, um, David's siblings would not have that status because they are not descended from a king, right? David's father is, is Jesse or Yishai, and Yishai is not royal himself. David is the first one to be royal in the family. And so therefore, while Rabbi Chia is related to King David's family, he doesn't have the royalty that Rebbe does by virtue of being descended from one of, of, um, of David's sons. So um, it seems here basically that what has happened is that um, Rebbe has um been quote unquote saved and i hope it's clear that i say that with a degree of sarcasm that rebbe has been saved from an improper marriage and the improper marriage we would have assumed maybe usually it would be like oh she is uh what's known as a mom zeret right she is born of an improper sexual relationship maybe she's descended from a slave there are problems with free people marrying slaves but no actually it's just that she's not descended from royalty and rebbe's son is descended from royalty and that is the reason that they they can't get married um, so Rebbe has a very sort of calculating um, approach to this, but we need to scroll down to, to story number five to really see the full on implications of this in light of our lens, which is the question, thank you, which is the question of um, what are what are the implications of this in terms of um, in terms of parents and um, parents and their children and husbands and their wives in terms of the learning of Torah study. So um, so remember that Rebbe's son has um, has been experiencing this, right? He was supposed to marry Rebbe Chia's daughter. That didn't work out. And so what happened? Uh, Rebbe then went and busied himself with marrying his son to um, into the family of Rebbe Yossi ben Zimra, right? So now Rebbe's son is going to marry Rebbe Yossi ben Zimra's daughter. And it seems that as part of the negotiations in terms of what is this going to, to look like, part of what they agreed to is it was agreed that he should spend 12 years in the baby drash. So it seems that the agreement is basically he will go away and learn. Um, and then after 12 years, he'll come back and he will and he will marry her. That seems to be the vision. So what happens? The girl passed before him, meaning it seems that before this, Rebbe's son has never seen the daughter of Rebbe Yossi Ben Zimmer, who he's meant to marry. But um, and now that they've come to this agreement that he'll go away and learn for 12 years and then he'll come back and um, and marry her, then he sees her and he says to them, let it be six years, right? So it seems that he um, is interested in marrying her and inter interested in marrying her sooner rather than later. So he says, basically, instead of delaying the marriage for, for 12 years, let's delay it for six years. She passed before him a second time and he said, I would rather marry her first and then proceed to the academy. Right, so it seems that he is very taken with her. You can read the more romantic vision of this, which is the version I personally prefer, which is the version wherein um, 
wherein he sort of falls in love with her when he first sees her. Of course, you can also imagine the, the less romantic version, which is basically he's very sexually attracted to her and he um, sort of wants the, wants the opportunity for permitted sexual expression and therefore he, um, he wants to marry her right away. But either way, right, he, he has this desire that um, his desire to be married is stronger than his desire to learn Torah, which is in contradistinction to what we saw in the previous stories where we have these rabbis who are so absorbed in their learning that they basically forget about their families. So what happened? Um, he, was, he was embarrassed in front of his father, right? He was embarrassed that he wasn't so excited to have these 12 years to go and learn, but instead he wanted to, um, to, to stay at home and marry her and then go away to learn. Um, and this is actually a very nice moment. And I will say that um, someone actually taught this, this story at one of my Sheva Brachot after I got married. Um, so Rebbe says to his son, my son, you have the mind of your creator, meaning you think like God did. What does he mean? For it is written first, you shall bring them in and you shall plant them. So this is from uh, Exodus 15, um, and the rest of that verse, which they don't quote here is the Har Kochecha, right? That you should bring them in and plant them on, on uh, God's, uh, sorry, on my holy, uh, on my holy mountain, which is a reference to the building of the temple. The idea being that once Israel enters the, the land of Israel, um, they will, they will go forth and they will build the, um, they will build the Beit HaMikdash, they will build the temple. And what we see there is the vision of building God's house is very much tied to them entering the land. But what happens just a few chapters later in, in chapter 25 of Exodus, God says, You shall make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So what does this mean? This means that originally God said, you'll build me a house and I'll come and live with you um, once you enter the land. And before that, we're not going to have sort of that formal space. But then just a few chapters later, just 10 chapters later, God changes God's mind and says, actually, I want you to, I want to have a place to dwell among you now, right? That God is seeking this intimacy now. And so what Rebbe is saying to his son is, my son, don't feel embarrassed that you're seeking this intimacy now, that you want to seek this intimacy even before you, you seek intimacy with Torah. Because in fact, God does the same thing. God originally is going to delay the, um, the marriage between God and, and the Jewish people until they enter the land. And then God says, actually, I'd rather marry you right now. So I think this is actually a very, a very nice moment. Um, but then it turns not so, so nice after that, because what happened? So after the marriage, soon they got married, they consummated the marriage. He stuck around maybe for a week, maybe for a month, not for so long. He departed and spent 12 years at the academy. And I want to note, right, the idea that first, he, the original vision was he was going to spend 12 years and then marry her. And now the vision is he's going to marry her and then spend 12 years. Other than the fact that they've consummated the marriage, I think it's worth noting that for her, it's not clear to me that this is any better. It might be slightly better because she now has the status sort of associated with Rebbe, uh, Rebbe Huda Hanasi's household. So maybe that piece of it is better, but she still is being like abandoned by her husband for 12 years. Okay, so by the time he returned, his wife had become infertile, um, right? Akara, this language that we see also in the Torah, she is infertile. Um, and so Rebbe said, presumably not to his son, he seems to just be like talking into the world. Rebbe said, what shall we do? If we order him to divorce her, it will be said, this poor soul waited in vain, right? So Rebbe now has sort of a political problem. The political problem is if what we say is um, he, should, he should divorce her, then um, it looks bad, right? Because she waited for 12 years. She married him. She waited for 12 years for him to come back. And now he comes back. And because she can't have children, he's going to divorce her, right? That seems very cruel. Um, and so what's the other option? Another option is he could marry another woman, meaning in addition to this. So maybe he should just have two wives and one wife can give him children and the other wife won't give him children. But again, similar to what I was saying before, this gives him the, uh, the opportunity to uphold his obligation to be fruitful and multiply while still maintaining his marriage to, um, to Rebbe Yossi Zimra's daughter. Um, but the problem with this is people will say, this is his wife and this is his prostitute, right? It's a very, very jarring language. Zo ishto vizo zonato. This is his wife, this is his whore. This is his wife, this is his prostitute. And it's interesting. I actually go back and forth every time I read the story as to who the wife is and who the prostitute is, right? Because I think you can imagine it both ways. 
So one way to imagine it is the daughter of Rabbi Yossi ben Zimra is the wife, because she is the one who, who Rabbi, Yossi Anasi, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi's son has loved and married, and the second wife is just there for purposes of having sex and procreation, but is not really the real wife. But you can also read it the other way, wherein the wife is um, the second wife and the prostitute is the second one because he basically, she's only there for having sex, right? Because she's, she's not even gonna provide children. So she's literally only there for having sex. Um, and so therefore um, that also doesn't seem like a good solution. So what does he do? Luckily we have this um, realization of this, um, you know, of this vision. What does he do? He asks for mercy and um and she recovered and th therefore she became able to to have children again so you know obviously at the end of the story there's an element of of wishful thinking that's applied because what we see is that um somebody who previously was not able to have children um just through the act of Revy saying well this is going to create a problem for us and therefore i'm just going to pray for her and then she'll be able to have children um we all know that unfortunately life is not always that simple um but i think part of what the, the end part of this story is getting at is the question of like, what is the purpose of a wife? Because as much as we were talking above about the idea that it's good to have sex with your wife on our Shabbat and the pleasure of sex is good and it's something that you owe to your wife and all of those different pieces that came forward in, in the earlier part of the story. What we see here is there's still a discomfort with the idea to go back to the, the question that somebody asked. There's still a discomfort here with the idea that somebody would marry this woman just for the sake of he enjoys having sex with her, right? That once you know she can't have children, um, that there's something sort of unseemly about it, presumably because they haven't had children already. Um, but again, right, we have the same trope where the, the um, there's this long period of time, right? Here they're apart for 12 years. So he's not coming home every week. He's not even coming home every year. Seems he's not coming home at all for 12 years because that's what her father and his father agreed to. Um, and there's this, again, this trauma that arises from that separation. So even while Rebbe is able to sort of pray that trauma away um, in this particular case, and she recovers, it's interesting to think about um, what exactly are we meant to take from the fact that this is what happens to his wife? Is it, oh, all's well that ends well because she quote unquote recovers from her infertility, she is now fine and so it doesn't matter? Or is there a little bit of an element of rebuke in this of, what does it mean that we, right, we made this poor soul wait in vain? What does it mean that we, we took this woman and we, um, we forced her to wait for all this period of time? And especially in light of the, the story in part four, where Rebbe there too is concerned about a political problem, you'll notice that once again, the actual husband and wife are missing from this part of the story, um, right? That the, we know that the son desired to marry her sooner rather than later. But once he comes back, he and his wife are both absent. We know nothing about what it is that they want or prefer. Um, so that's worth noting. And again, here, Rebbe's concerned about maybe there's some sort of political problem, right? What will people say? What will people say if my son marries someone who it turns out doesn't have proper lineage? What will people say if he, his wife, um, his wife is, he's married to someone who he knows can't have children. And so it, it feels to me, like a little bit of an indictment of Rebbe. I think I'm much more inclined to indict Rebbe here than the authors of the text are, and that's worth noting. I don't wanna claim that they are reading this through the same lens that I am. But again, why can't the son take his wife with him when they go away and learn? There has to be this sort of separation, it seems. But once again, what we see is that the separation has very significant consequences for the people that are involved. And even though at the end, you know, presumably they're able to have children and everything's fine, you know, the sting and the trauma of that is not something that's necessarily going to go away. And so I wonder a little bit if the authors of the story are, I don't know if I wanna say they're, they're inciting Rebbe, that might be too strong of a word, but I think they're at least complicating what it means for us to look at this and say, um, and say, what, why exactly is this the ideal? Why is the ideal that you marry someone and then you abandon them? right, that there are clear consequences to that because he comes home and she can't have children anymore. And so that's a consequence that we, we can't really step away from. Um, okay, so before we do the last two stories, I will pause again here and then we'll go to the last two. Great. Um, there are a few questions that, that are all getting at the same point, which is 
um, the consequences in these stories are so extreme. It, you know, people people die as a result of these mm -hmm. um, these tensions and problems that are at play, and it doesn't seem to um, you know to allow for for chuva, you know, for learning a lesson and doing it differently the next time, um, and and. And, and in some of the, um, you know, and in the opening two stories, there's also kind of kind of a passivity to, um, to to the role of the man. It's like, you know, the Rav Rahumi, for example, he dies because of his wife's emotions. He's just sort of walking along. There's, um, it's it, it's it's very extreme. It's very final. It doesn't it doesn't seem to um, allow for growth. Let's say. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think the other piece of it that's interesting is that the woman who is suffering, right? I, I see it as a form of divine retribution that is being visited upon these men for acting this way, but often it's the woman who suffers. The woman suffers because now she's a widow. The woman suffers because now she is um, unable to have children. So that's part of what's interesting here is that the, yes, there are consequences for the for the men, right? Rebbe is concerned that he looks bad, but it's his daughter-in-law who's the one who can't actually have children. Um, you know, um, Rev Rahumi's wife is, is as Rev Rahumi is the one who falls off the roof and dies, which is obviously extremely bad. But now his wife, who was used to only having him once a year, but clearly looked forward to it, now he's totally absent from that. And so um, this is why at the beginning of the story, I, when we first started these stories, that part of what I said was um, that I don't think it's important for us to read these stories as true, but I instead think it's important for us to read them as what are they trying to say to us? Because part of what I think these stories are trying to say to us in these particular cases are um, be careful that when you're creating the separation between your home life and your Torah life, that you don't get so absorbed into one that you totally forget about the other. Now, I would be interested to read a story where there's someone who is meant to go away to the academy and then decides not to go at all, right? Not, not the story what we have here, but be some where he wants to get married and then go away. What would it look like if someone said, actually, I'm so absorbed in my home life that I don't want to go away and learn Torah? What would the consequences be for that person as well, right? What, what might that look like? Because part of what we know is that the Torah is... Um, Torah is meant to be like your one of your big life obligations that it's one of the obligations that a father has to his son is to teach him Torah and then they say though don't think that just because you've now taught your son Torah that that means you're exempt from learning Torah that you still have to go out and, and continue to learn Torah in that way and so um yeah so this is why I think it's important right the, the, it is very very extreme and that's why I'm inclined to read these almost as parables or as fables of sorts that that these feel to me like the, the clear message of Aesop's fables or of Greek mythology or of um, you know fairy tales pre pre Disneyfication I guess right the like sort of the Green Brothers of fairy, fairy tale versions where pe bad things happen and then that that's just sort of the destruction at the end um, that's my inclination in terms of how to read these stories because I think that part of what's part of the point the rabbis are trying to make here is maybe because elsewhere they so much emphasize going away to learn Torah that you might be concerned that that means that you um, should only learn Torah. And if you neglect your family, it doesn't matter. And so the answer is no, if you neglect your family completely, it does matter. The question, the problem is they're not showing here, here's how to find a balance, right? I think that's what we would really want here. So we want to say, and so therefore, right? So we see the ideal, the ideal is you come home every Friday night, you come home every, every week for Shabbat, or what it said in the Mishnah that you can go away for 30 days, but not longer than that. Um, but I think, you know, the other piece of it is I think we all know that um, you do feel pulled by different priorities. And this can be a matter of family life versus Torah or family life versus work or work versus leisure or work versus other work. Right? I, I, don't, I don't even think you have to have wives and children to, to imagine what this looks like. And there are times when the balance gets out of whack. And so, yes, it's very extreme to say, well, we're just gonna kill the person who got the balance out of whack, especially because that means that they're never gonna get a chance to put it back together again, which is problematic. Um, but but the, uh, that, I think the fable aspect of this is, is, a bit, is the most useful way to read it for that exact reason, because otherwise these stories just seem absurd. And so therefore, rather than reading them as reflective of historical realities, think what does it mean that the authors chose to write these stories in this way? And what does it mean actually that they do warn against too much Torah where I might have expected them to warn against too much family? These are the rabbis, right? They, they've devoted their lives to Torah. Torah is their thing. Um, and even so they're aware of 
the idea that you can get sucked too far into this and and not be able to let go from there. Right. So so if we want to learn about the value of chuva, there are other stories to do that. These stories want to make a certain a different kind of message very clear. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Um, but but I think it is problematic that there's no opportunity for them to learn and do better. Um, because if these are first time offenses, we don't know that, but if these are first time offenses, then it's certainly the case that you would imagine that it would be better for everybody if they learned some sort of lesson such that they never forgot to go home again and then everyone move forward from there rather than just saying, well, now he's dead and she's a widow and everything is terrible for everyone, which seems to be basically where we end up. Do you want one more? We can take one more, yeah. Um, so I thought this was an interesting perspective um, and you, know, you were talking about how um, I think it was Robert Hume. He he, right. He he went off to Mahoza. Did, he apparently didn't consider, you know, bringing his family there. That you know that the rabbis, these rabbis in this cycle of stories, seem to think, you know, family is here geographically and Torah is here geographically. And someone was raising the point, um, you know, maybe the women and the families don't, don't actually want that. Right? Maybe maybe this um, arrangement of of the men taking off for extended periods um, suits them. And, and which, which I think is just another um, interesting reflection on, you know, the work from home situation that a lot of people are dealing with. You know, you made that comment. I was thinking, gosh, it's so it's so impossible to create those boundaries now for people who are working from home. Um, and a flip side of it is is um, <laughs> people don't always want their spouses working from home either. It's um, anyway, we haven't we sort of have we've been assuming that the women want their husbands around more. It seems right. Like. No, I think that that's a very important point, and it's actually a great lead in to the last two stories because they are going to offer that model of wives who either just sort of live their lives because they assume that their husbands aren't going to come back, or alternatively, um, wives who actually don't seem to like actively don't care that their husbands aren't there. Because look, if your husband is gone for 364 days a year, or if your husband is gone for 12 years, either you can sit and mourn that he's missing or you can get up and live your life. And, and, and I'm assuming that in these cases, the women are provided for in whatever way such their material needs are met, which is part of the obligation the husband has to his wife. Assuming that's the case, if your husband is gone for 12 years, like, yeah, you are gonna build a life without him there and you're just gonna find a way to do that. Um, it's interesting that, that, that what, what you might imagine is discomfort around that actually does come out in these stories, right? It's not, oh no, now these women have built strong independent lives where they don't need their husbands or whatever else. That actually is not part of the narrative, um, at least not directly. But um, I think, you know, thinking about what this would look like for the women and how the women would say, yes, well, my husband's gone indefinitely. And so this is just how things are. And this is how I'm going to live my life. You know, that's part of what I think is so striking about the first story with River Humi, where his wife is like sitting and waiting for him and she's crying. Um, whereas in the other stories, the wives are kind of absent and it's not, and it's actually the men who are concerned about what's happening, right? It's the father-in-law. It's actually in both the two stories we saw, right? Both Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi and Rabbi Yanai, both of them, it's the father-in-law who's concerned about what's happening, right? Oh no, this woman is now unable to have children. Oh no, he would have come home. So it must be that he's dead, right? So that element of it that gets added in, but that the, the women are absent, which is not unusual. We're, we're used to women being absent from these stories, but you could imagine a scenario where they're absent because they just say, well, this is just how life is. And I live my life apart from my husband. And sometimes he comes home and that's fine. But the rest of the time I do what I need to do. And, you know, I have responsibilities and I have to do laundry and there might be children and all those other pieces. So let's go to these last two stories because I think they're actually going to speak to this very nicely. Um, and they're going to complicate what we saw above a little bit, a little bit, because part of what we saw above is the sense that um, this is very, very tragic, right? That what happens in these cases is very, very tragic. People die, women become infertile, all of those different pieces. And these last two stories complicate that model a little bit. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge that. So what we have in story six, we have Rabbi Hananiah ben Chachinai, try saying that five times fast, Rabbi Hananiah ben Chachinai was about to go away to the Beit Midrash towards the end of Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai's wedding. Now, it's interesting that they particularly mentioned here Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai. I'm not going to talk about him too much, but one of the things we know about him from elsewhere is that he famously is targeted by the Romans and therefore goes, um, originally he goes and hides in the Beit Midrash with his son. And then ultimately they leave the baby drash. Why? Because his wife knows that he's there. She's been bringing food. And his concern is that she'll be weak in the face of torture, 
torture. It's not very sympathetic. She'll be weak in the face of torture. And therefore he runs away again and hides in a cave with his son where not even his wife knows where he is. So what we see is that Rishimo ben Yochai is, the, and then they spend all the 12 years in the cave learning Torah. So what we see with Rabbi Shimo ben Yochai is he is someone who very much favors Torah over marriage and his he doesn't have, hold his wife in very high esteem. So it's just worth noting that um, it's his wedding that appears in this story. So Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai said to Rabbi Hanania, wait for me until I'm able to join you. Nothing like being at your own wedding and hearing your husband say, I can't wait to get out of here, but that's what happens. But Rabbi Hanania did not wait for him. And it's worth us wondering what this original piece of the story is doing here, this opening, because it actually has very little to do with what comes next. So Rabbi Hanania went and spent 12 years in the Beit Midrash. When he returned, the streets of his town were altered and he was unable to find his way home. So he's been gone for so long that he literally no longer knows where his, where his house is. Um, and this is, it's interesting to read because the language is um, lo yada le mezil le beite. He doesn't know how to go to his house, but that word beite also refers to a wife. So there's this idea in rabbinic literature of ishto kebeto, that a man's wife is like his house. Um, and so therefore a woman is sometimes called beite, his house. Um, so I just, I, I, I assume it's intentional on the part of the author that we have this pun here, wherein he doesn't know how to go to his house. He also doesn't know how to go home to his wife. Um, okay, so what did he do? He went and sat down on the riverbank and he heard a girl being addressed, daughter of Chachinai, daughter of Chachinai, fill your pitcher and let us go. Um, and he said, it is clear from this that the girl is ours and he followed her. So. Um, a number of things that, that happen here. So first of all, notice that his daughter, first of all, he doesn't recognize his daughter, which I guess if he's been away for 12 years is not surprising. It's not clear to me from the story if he knows he has a daughter or not, right? When he says this girl is ours, it's not clear to me if that means I didn't know I had a child at all, or I knew I had this daughter, but I didn't know that that was her because 12 years is a very long time and children change a lot in 12 years. Um, but either way, and the other thing that's worth noting is that she's being called daughter of Kachinai, who is his father. So she's not being called daughter of Kanania. She's not being called by, as daughter of her father. She's being called daughter of her grandfather, um, which is not so surprising. She's likely living on um, in her grandfather's household. As I said, usually what happens when a woman gets married is she'll go out and she will marry, um, she will go out and she will live with her, with her husband's household. So, um, okay, so what does he do? So he follows her, which is, today we would say this is somewhat creepy, but I guess maybe things are different in time at all, but so he follows her home. And his wife was sitting and sifting flour. She lifted up her eyes and seeing him, her heart seized up and the spirit went out of her. Um, so it's the language that they use here is interesting, right? Para Ravka, um, which to me says that there's a little bit of a hesitancy to say that she, Right, they don't say nach nachsha, they don't say she died, said her spirit went out of her, which probably means she fainted, but it likely appears to Hananya that her uh, that his wife has died. So the, the difference here between what actually happens and what he perceives is, is important. So, because what does he say? He says before God, Ribono Shalala, master of the universe, this poor soul, is this her reward? Right, she waited for me for 12 years, and now you're gonna have it be that she dies right when I come home. And so he prayed for mercy to be visited upon her and she she lived, she came back to life, which, excuse me, again, I assume that she came back to consciousness. So she had been unconscious previously and now, um, and now she, she comes back to life. So this story is different from the previous ones for a number of reasons, but a few things that I wanna point out here. So the first thing I'd like to point out is that it seems that his wife has no expectation of him coming home. So whether the deal was always that she would come home after 12 years or whether he just assumed that at some point he would come home or maybe she thought he was never gonna come home. She seems, right, she, it's so shocking to her to see him that she, she loses consciousness. She passes out when she sees him. He, on the other hand, is so far removed from his home life that he literally can't find his way home, cannot recognize his daughter. And as I said, based on the pun in the Aramaic, maybe can't recognize his wife either. And so this sense that he's so far removed from it, and I don't think it's an accident that in this story, it's a daughter and not a son. That seems intentional to me on the part of the authors that I assume that if it were a son, um, this narrative would be a little bit more complicated. And we'll also see that in a minute when we get to story number seven. 
The third thing I want to point out here um, is this idea that right, she she deserves to be rewarded for the fact that she left her husband, that she let her husband go for this period of time. It's possible she consented to it in light of what we saw in the Mishnah, right, where the Mishnah had said um, 30 days without consent, but longer if you have consent. So it's possible she consented to it. Although I wonder if your husband comes to you in this period of time and says, I want to go for 12 years, if you really have the power to say no to him, right? It, it's interesting to think about the dynamics of, in terms of what that might look like. Um, and, but there's something so striking about it because, you know, to go back to the question someone asked before, it does seem to me that in this case, they're just living their lives, right? The daughter, she goes to get water and the mother is sifting, sifting flour. They're making their bread. They're living on in his father's household to the point where his daughter is identified with his father rather than with him all of those different pieces. And so when I read this, part of what I see is this sense, to, unlike the story that we, the, the first story that we saw of her Rahumi, where she's sitting at home and she's waiting for her husband and she's crying and saying, when's he gonna come? That here, these are two women who are just doing their thing to the point where when he actually finally appears home again, it's actually shocking, right? It, it actually causes her to, to faint and lose consciousness because it's so surprising that he would come back. And so if we think about what does it mean for the, the husbands to be to, to say, oh, I need to go away and learn, I think it's important for us to realize that it's potentially very disruptive for the wives to, um, to have their husbands come back. So for every wife there is who's sitting and crying because she wants her husband to come and he hasn't come, there's another wife like this who's just living her life and it's so surprising to her that her husband would come back. And I wonder, right, in the end, he's able to pray for her. And again, she's revived in this sort of way. Um, but I wonder if this is a little bit an indictment of him again. Um, I'm inclined to see it as not nearly as much of an indictment as we have above, but a little bit of an indictment of him on one hand, wherein it shouldn't be this shocking to your family when you show up. But on the other hand, and I think that this is worth noting, um, that it appears in the Rebbe story and then in this story too, which we didn't have previously, it's possible that part of the reason his prayers are so powerful is because he's devoted so much time to learning Torah. And that's part of what's difficult here, I think, is that his Torah learning maybe makes it so that he is seen by God as someone whose prayer should be answered on one hand. But on the other hand, if he hadn't gone for so long, he wouldn't have needed to pray in this way at all. And so the tension between those two things, how exactly should they should they play out, right? What does it mean for someone to be able to, to think that they are essentially praying to revive the dead, even if they aren't actually, um, that that's, that's complicated in light of everything that's happening here. Um, so let's go to the seventh story and then we'll look at this holistically and take final comments. So this is the last story before the Rabbi Kiva story. Um, and this is the story of Rabbi Chama Barbisa and it's going to complicate a lot of what I've asserted above. Um, but I think it's important for us to note in, in moments where, you know, it's very rare that stories tell, or at least well-written stories go only in one direction or only in another. And this is a good example of that. So what do we have? Rabbi Chama Barbisa went and spent 12 years in the Beit Yitrash. And you'll notice we keep seeing this repetition of 12, right? The, the 12 keeps coming back. That seems to be their way of saying a very long time. So he spent 12 years in the Beit Yitrash. And when he returned, he said, I will not act as did Bar Chachinai, right? Basically, I'm not gonna go home after 12 years and just show up out of nowhere and totally scare the, what, the pants off my wife and have her be really surprised to see that I'm, to see that I'm there. Um, so instead, what did he do? He answered the local Beit Midrash and sent word to his house. So he sent a, a letter to his wife saying that he was home. And I think it is worth noting here, I think it's important to the story that there is a local Beit Midrash. So part of what this tells us now, it might not be as good as the one that he went away to, but part of what this tells us is that it's totally possible that he could have stayed home and learned Torah, but he didn't do so. This is gonna become important for us. So his son, Rabbi Oshia entered, sat down before him and addressed, him, uh, uh, addressed a question to him on one of the subjects of study. It seems that Rabbi Oshia well, it's clear that Chama Barbisa doesn't know that Oshia is his son. We'll see that even more in a minute. It's not clear to me, and I'm interested if people have feelings on this, if Oshia knows that this is his father. I think probably not. 
Um, I think they neither of them recognize each other, but it's unclear one way or the other. So as I said, this is different than the story we saw above. The story above with, with um, Hananya, Hananya Bar Barfakinai, he didn't know that his, he didn't recognize his daughter. Um, his daughter didn't recognize him. That's maybe not surprising in a world that is extremely gender segregated, but it's worth us noting here that the same thing is happening with a, with a son. Um, so what happens? Rabbi Chama Barbisa becomes depressed. Um, and this is, uh, right, he becomes very, very sad. And this is the, um, the same language we saw above actually with the wife of Rev Rehumi who, Chalash um, Data, right, her mind became weak. The same thing is happening here. Chalash Date, Rabbi Oshia's mind became weak. Um, he said, if I had been here, I could also have had such a child. So there's obviously a very interesting double meaning to, to his statement here, because on one hand, he has such a child, right? So saying I could have had such a child, he has such a child, a child who is asking really good questions, who seems to be very brilliant, who's a, um, a prodigy in the baby drash, um, and in the local baby drash either, right? So in this way, um, He's getting that and he also got to go away and learn. But on the other hand, he's so far estranged from his family that he doesn't even recognize, um, he doesn't even recognize his own son and therefore doesn't get to take pleasure in or credit for the son's accomplishments. So what happened? Um, when he entered his house, so presumably his wife sent a message back, that part is missing in the story, something like that saying, okay, you can come home. Thanks for letting me know whatever else it is. But when he entered his house, his son came in, right? Because his son is also going home and the father rose before him. Now in the, in the Talmud um, and even today in some communities, the way that you show respect to a Torah scholar is you rise before them. Um, so you stand up in front of them and it's, it's a sign of respect. And so this is very unusual because usually when somebody stands before somebody else, the, the son would stand before the father, not the other way around. So uh, Rabbi Chama Barbisa stands before Rabbi Oshia because he thought that this very brilliant scholar had come to ask him more, more halakhic questions, right? That he didn't think he was just coming home at the end of the day. He thinks that um, he's come to ask him questions. So his wife takes great amusement in this. And I have to say, the wife of Rabbi Chama Barbisa is one of my favorite characters in these stories. Um, his wife said to him, what father stands up before his son? So she realizes right away exactly what's happening. She realizes that Rabbi Chama Barbisa doesn't recognize Rabbi Oshia. Um, and he, she realizes also that Rabbi Yoshia is being given this credit as a, as a Torah scholar, and this is my own interpretation. I don't know if this is inherent in the text itself, but part of what I note when I look at that is it also seems to me to be a great credit to her, because if her son was able to learn all of this Torah while her husband was away, presumably she is the one, not necessarily who was teaching him, but who enabled that to happen, who provided the resources, who encouraged him to go to the Beit Midrash, whatever else it was, that Rabbi Oshia, um, while Rabbi Chama is saying, I wish I had a son like this, his wife actually does have a son like this. And that's despite the fact that she's a wife, right? She's the woman, and therefore we expect her to exist outside of the realm of Torah. But instead, she, um, she has so much raised a Torah scholar, even without her husband there, that um, her husband now rises before the son, which is this inversion of, of status. Um, and that's the end of the, um, um, that's the end of the, the story. And then there's this note that comes at the end. So Rami Barfama, um, who is not Kama Barbisa, so new character, Rami Barfama, maybe one of his other sons, unclear, because this is Kama also, um, applied to him, the, this verse, um, again, from Kohelet, from Ecclesiastes, um, a threefold cord is not quickly broken, right? The idea being uh, the verse is, it's if a cord is made up of three different pieces of fabric that are twisted together, it's much harder to cut than, than a single a cord made up of only a single set of fibers. Um, and the interpretation that Rabbi Barakama gives is this is Rabbi Oshia, the son of Rabbi Chama, the son of Bisa. So what we see here is at the end, Rabbi, Rabbi Barakama is basically says, the strength of Rabbi Oshia's Torah is made even stronger by virtue of the fact that both his father and his grandfather were great Torah scholars as well. But part of what becomes clear over the course of this story is that um, Rabbi Oshia is in certain ways following the example of his father in that he, um, he's devoted himself to Torah study. He's become such a wonderful student and, and scholar that his father wishes that he had a son like him. Um, but on the other hand, the other thing we see for Rabbi Oshia is that 
um, actually maybe Chama Barbisa didn't need to go away at all, right? On one hand, maybe he did. Maybe the reason why Rabbi Oshia was so motivated to go away and study, uh, sorry, to stay home and study was because he saw the devotion his father showed. His father was willing to even um, abandon the family essentially in order to go learn Torah. And that must mean that Torah is very important. On the other hand, the other way to see it is to say um, that um, Rabbi Chama Barbisa actually could have had both. That as much as the story has a happy ending, because the, the son knows a lot of Torah and his wife doesn't die and he doesn't die, right? So this story is certainly much more positive than the other ones. But on the other hand, he's filled with this regret because he missed the chance to, to see his son grow into this person. And so I guess the question is, is the outcome what's important to him? In which case, it's great that he went away for 12 years because he does have a son like this. Or does is the lack of process um, important to him? In which case, this really challenges the model that we saw above wherein you can have Torah or you can have family, but you can have both, but you can't have both at the same time, that actually he says, right, I wish I, I, wish I could have um, stayed here and thus I could have had such a child that he could have stayed there. And that's this idea that you have to go away in order to make this happen, that even in the story where there's a happy ending, there's regret acknowledging the fact that maybe you didn't actually have to go away to make this happen in the end. Um, so then part of what we see then, if we look at all of these stories together, I think, is this sense that um, there's very much a um, there's very much a consequence when things get out of balance, and whether the consequence is somebody falls ill, somebody becomes infertile, um, somebody dies, God forbid, right? What even if the consequences are reversible, right? She's able to pray, and the infertility comes, uh, and the, he's able to pray, and the infertility goes away. Um, you know, he's able to pray and his wife remains consciousness, all of those things, that there's an element of, I, I would say, and maybe this is my modern reading, um, but I'm, I'm the one teaching the sex right now, so I'm allowed, that there's an element of lasting trauma potentially that exists in all of this. And that at the same time, um, the story at the end that really complicates all of this is, is the reminder that actually there is a baby drash in his hometown and he could have had all of this in the end, um, if only he had had a different vision of what it meant to, to learn Torah and have family at the same time. Um, so we have a few minutes left, so I'm happy to take um, a few closing comments or questions. Uh, so really just on that last point that you shared, um, um, someone raised the idea that right, the, the local baby drash is not necessarily on par with, um, you know, with the great yeshiva where these people might go and, and raise the interesting analogy of um, Olympic athletes who we've been focused on lately, right? Often they start in their local gym, but then they have to move far away to get the best, the best training experience. So I guess it's, 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 um, maybe challenging that, that point of yours. Yes, I think that's true. Although I, I've watched a lot of Olympics and, um, one of my favorites is this 15 year old. I don't know if anyone saw her named Lydia Jacoby, who's a swimmer and she's from Seward, Alaska. And there's only one Olympic length pool in all of Alaska. Um, most of the pools are 25 meters instead of 50 meters. And she was able to stay home in Seward, Alaska and train for the Olympics. Right now, she's clearly an extraordinary talent, even more extraordinary than the other ones. The other one was there was a diver from Saskatchewan, um, Canada, which is also not a place that one usually would associate with diving. And that most divers in Canada usually go to Montreal, but he apparently is sort of somewhat of a contrarian and chose to stay home. And so, um, I think the answer is if you're really committed to staying home and to accomplishing this thing, you can do it, but that most people don't have that sort of discipline, right? I certainly don't have that sort of discipline. And I mean, the only thing stopping me from being an Olympian is not that I have chosen to stay home, right? There are many other things also stopping me from being an Olympian, but that that sense that there are people who are able to do it. Rabbi Oshia is able to do it, right? Rabbi Oshia is such an extraordinary scholar that his father stands for, stands for him as a sign of respect. And so, um, but yes, maybe that's only the most extraordinary people. Um, and I, I accept that, but I still am not clear on other than maybe the wives don't want to go because they lose their entire infrastructure, why it seems impossible, the idea that the wife would go with you or that she would potentially travel there, right? There's some sort of like shuttle that takes the wives there for Shabbat or whatever else. Um, um, and, and I think, you know, to go back to the idea that these are somewhat allegorical, right? The 12 years, I don't think is like specifically, definitely 12 years. I think that's their way of saying a very, very long time. Um, but also the idea that the only way to learn Torah is to go away and live away from the world, basically, and live in that rarefied bubble of yeshiva for a very, very long time. I actually think that really flies 
in the face of what the rabbis usually assume should be happening, where what they usually assume actually is that you're going to go to yeshiva two months a year, once in the fall and once in the spring, and then you're going to be given material to learn and go home and work on your farm or whatever else, because most people are not wealthy enough to go away and learn Torah and not do something else on the side. Um, so this is not, on one hand, it's a fantasy, but we also see the fantasy get corrupted very quickly. I guess the Olympic athletes also, most of them are, are um, pre, right? They're young, so they're- Yes, um, yes, exactly. Um, so I guess just in, in our last few minutes, um, maybe um, how, how do you, how do you want to relate this to, um, to our challenges today? Um, and, and right, we have, we have sort of this, excuse me, the specific work-life balances, balance issues of uh, the work from home situation that I described before, but that's, um, you know, atypical for most people. Um, so what do, what do you learn from this mm -hmm. about, uh, about work-life balance or about, um, I mean, maybe re really this, maybe we want to pursue further this idea of, um, you know, having such strict boundaries between work and home as you, um, between study and home or work and home as you were just describing. So, I mean, the first thing, and this is not a solution, but is that this is not a new question. And I think we tend to think of it as a new question. And part of the reason why is because the automatically assumed gender roles, and also there's only one way for a family to exist, which is a man marries a woman and then they have children and then the woman stays home and takes care of the children and the men go off and do whatever it is that they're doing. Um, once we move away from that model, you know, a lot, a lot has been said in the last year and a half about the problem is that um, and this was true even before COVID, that the problem is that our system is set up for one parent to work outside the home and one parent to not work outside of the home. And that it's totally unsustainable and forget to, you know, where, where there are two parents working outside of the home and then all the more so if there's only one parent, right? A single family, a single parent situation, et cetera. So that's, that I think is one piece of this, but, but the idea that the rabbis are struggling with it, I think is important. And, and, you know, obviously I think they would say, well, work is different than Torah. Like the difference between learning Torah full-time and working full-time is that working full-time, they would say, well, yeah, you have to work to make money to support your family, but that's not a noble endeavor. But even with the noblest of endeavors, right? And we can imagine a lot of different scenarios that might count as that. So for example, if you are a, um, you know, a trauma surgeon, um, or if you are a, um, no, I would say like also a kindergarten teacher, right? Like there are certain, there are certain jobs, although kindergarten teachers, they tend to bring their work home, but their, their hours at work are more set. But right, there are certain things where we can say, even if that's what you're doing, right? Even if you're doing the most important thing in the world, even if you're learning Torah, even if you're a trauma surgeon, that you still have obligations to other people in your life. And that it's not, ultimately, it's going to lead to some sort of end of life. And whether the end of life happens in the form of death or whether it happens in the form of not being able to have children, right? Uh, much, and I say this as someone who got married in her 30s and had children in her 30s, like, um, or child so far, but, um, you know, much has been made of the professional women who are waiting too long to have kids, and now there are all these fertility things, but um, there's, there are realities of our society that makes that so, right, because we, like, don't have a, a, any infrastructure, I won't go into the politics right now, but anyway, but the point is um, that I think part of what we see is that if you want to build a family with someone, and that doesn't have to mean through marriage and children, I think it could mean close, like friends who are like family, right? I think it can take all these different forms. But if you wanna do that, you have to invest in the relationships. And if you don't, even if you say, what I'm doing is the most important thing in the world, I am learning Torah, it's the most important thing in the world. Even if you say that, there are gonna be consequences for neglecting the other piece. And so, but I think the other piece, and this is honest, is that it's a struggle um, and that, the idea that you're going to leave your work at the door, you're going to come home every hour of Shabbat, sometimes you're going to get absorbed in your work and what happens then? But that when you've made commitments to other people, you don't get to only think about yourself. And I think that ultimately, even if the other thing you're thinking about is Torah, because I don't think, I wouldn't say that these rabbis are, are um, intentionally selfish, but they are unintentionally selfish. And that I think makes a really big difference in terms of what happens in these stories. Um, and the fact that the rabbis are telling those stories about themselves when they're learning Torah, I think shows the ambivalence that they feel about the fact that these are hard things to balance. Um, so I would, you know, if I had the solution, I would also be like making, giving a TED talk or something, but um, I, I don't have the solution, but I think it's worth us noting the cases where we can say this actually is not a new problem, right? These questions that we're asking, we have different structures and different demands on our times, but actually the 
the questions are the same. And sometimes the way we learn is not from what other people do, but it's also sometimes what not to do from, from things that have unintended consequences. River Hume doesn't want to die, right? And I, Rabbi Yehuda Nassi doesn't want his daughter-in-law to become infertile. And they just don't think about those, those consequences. And we can't anticipate all consequences in life, but um, it requires us to think outside of ourselves and what it is that we want to do. And I think that that's a big part of the message here. Thank you. And, and maybe just just to add that it's um, right. There's everything you just said um, so insightfully about, um, you know, about considering the consequences of um, an overzealous commitment to work um, at the expense of family. But there's also a message here about excessive piety. Right. If we just mm -hmm. just put aside the whole um, theme of work for a moment, even though that's the theme of our series, I think I think you've been part of what you've been saying is um, there's a misconception of what of what Torah is and what it demands of us um, in, in the behavior of these particular rabbis and, and the collection is meant to teach us that the Torah is part of life, not separate from life. Exactly. Right. And they say in Pirkei Avot, imein kemach in Torah, v'imein Torah in kemach. Right. If there's no bread, there's no Torah. And if there's no Torah, there's no bread. And so you need both of those things. You can't subsist on, on one or the other. Um, and our ongoing struggle as humans is to figure out how to balance those things against each other. So. Thank you so much for teaching today. Um, we you really took us deeply into these um, into these really interesting and vivid texts, and just really mind them for um, as you as you said at the outset. You know, really the values that are at play and the lessons. And I think there's there's so much for us to get out of it. Um, so thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very um, much. Um, thank you all for coming to make the time to learn together. Hopefully one day in person. Um, and I wish you all a wonderful rest of the Torah uh, summer and Shana Tova. Thanks everyone for coming and hope you join us next week. Um, Dr. Jonathan Ray, uh, GGS alumnus, will be teaching next week on, um, on the expulsion from Spain. A totally different kind of journey than what we've been doing today. So hope to see you then. Um, thanks again, everyone.